Bienvenidos nuevamente. Gracias por acompañarnos. Welcome again. Thank you for being with us. Let me tell you that currently we have 100 people connected online, 35 here in the room, and uh, 30 people at the hub in Pergamino. Now we will have the interview with Vincerf, the um, evangelist in chief of the internet. I'd like to give the floor to Oscar Robles and Carlos Martinez, the technology manager of Flacnic. Both of them had an opportunity to conduct the interview a few days ago. Thank you, Andrea. Well, some uh, of the people who have followed our announcements, you may know that uh, this year we committed, we, we um, Uh, interested APNIC for a study on the Internet, since continuously the Internet receives attacks to its uh, its strengths uh, and opportunities are uh, attacked. Uh, so uh, we uh, it's important to see what are the aspects that are not robust enough for the current uh, Uh, needs. Uh, a few months ago, China uh, presented a project, a new IP that they said would replace the Internet. So, uh, so as not to have a, a discussion without any sound uh, reasons, we decided to ask for that, um, uh, that uh, study and to see how many of the elements were relevant in the internet and the, the scalability and the growth in recent years, to what extent they continue to be present and what we're going to need in future years. So we have a wonderful guest. Carlos, could you tell us who it is? Yes. Of course, of all the times that I've had to read in public, I think that introducing Van Cerf is one of the most difficult things. He's super famous, super well known as the evangelist of technology and as a visionary of technology. Vint is one of the group of people that are considered the fathers of the Internet. In the late 60s, Vint Cerf used to work in uh, California in um, the famous uh, UCLA, University of California, Los Angeles, where they were working, researching what at the time was uh, the next frontier. Um, uh, it's what we know the packet networks. So at the time, those of us uh, who are old may remember the um, opposition of the circuit networks and the packet networks. Uh, the packet networks were revolutionary and they were the frontier of um, research. Vincent, together with other fathers of uh, the Internet, uh, such uh, as Leonard Kleindrock and others, they worked to do that uh, a reality. And after a long process, they managed to construct that first router or network interface at the time, at the time they were called IMPs. And in October 1969, they tried to do the first transmission using a packet protocol where they distinguish some of the characteristics that today we see in the IP protocol. That first um, Uh, transmission failed, as was to be expected. And they wanted to transmit a uh, login, but they, that string, but only L and O could be transmitted. And that was uh, the beginning of uh, what is now the Internet. This conceptual change was uh, very strong because it allows, and we're going to see that uh, in the exchanging uh, pieces and the protocol that is what makes the Internet strong. And uh, uh, Vint has a lot of uh, acknowledgments. He's a PhD and he's uh, a member of the Marconi Society. And for several years, he's been chief evangelist in Google. And listening to him is always a great pleasure. The document where they establish the definition of uh, the operations of the Internet is a protocol for packet network intercommunication. Some of the uh, uh, very savvy may know it, but when they were um, designing it, they had a dilemma that was to establish which of the two names, Vint Cerf's or Bob Cans, would go first. And the legend goes that they flipped a coin to see which name would be first. So. Vint Cerf was uh, one, and his name always comes first. But this is one of the few decisions that were for which they flipped a coin. 
there were many decisions that were conscious in the design of the internet that were not deliberate uh, that were not just uh, left uh, at random so the question was what were the factors that were not left um, uh, to fate in uh, the design of the internet that were significant for the development of the internet uh, in uh, the, these uh, 50 years so vint They're putting it. Uh, and second, yes, we really did flip a coin. Uh, the two of us uh, were two hands on one pencil in terms of li literally uh, writing that first paper. Uh, we, we just collaborated very, very closely together. So absolutely, there were several things that uh, jumped out at us right away. Uh, first of all, the networks that we were interconnecting, the mobile packet radio net, the ARPANET, and the packet satellite network, were independent networks that uh, did not have any concept of other than themselves. So each network thought it was the only network in the world that had an address space which was specific to that network. So we knew that no matter what we did, we'd have to put a box in between each network that knew how it was connected to each of them, but it also knew that it was part of this internet thing. And of course, that led to uh, the obvious thing, which was to design an internet address space, the I what we call today the IP address space. Uh, and we decided to um, create the uh, internet protocol layer and then encapsulate internet packets in whatever the local payload was for the networks that were being interconnected by what we call gateways. Today, you'd call them routers. So the idea of encapsulating an IP packet and payload of the lower level network was very important. So was the design of the internet address space, which was not country coded. So those addresses are purely topological. They reflect how the networks are uh, interconnected to each other um, by way of a protocol, which today we call the border gateway protocol, which allows the routers at the edges of the networks to communicate with each other in order to say how they are interconnected in the rest of the network. So the topology is encapsulated uh, in the routing tables or the forwarding tables. The third thing which I think is important is that we split the internet protocol away from TCP, which was described in the 1974 paper, in order to support real-time communication, which did not require sequential delivery, and did not require uh, full delivery, you know, at, uh, retransmissions and so on. It was just a low latency mechanism. And that was driven by the recognition that we needed uh, to support low latency more than uh, complete delivery for things like packet speech and packet voice uh, or, or packet video, uh, radar uh, tracking and things of those, sort, uh, of those sorts. So we split the TCP and the IP off and formed the user datagram protocol layer on top of IP. So we had TCP and UDP for two different kinds of applications. Es decir, fueron conscientes de que conectaban redes de diferentes... So you, you were aware that um, you were um, applying uh, networks. One of the criticisms that uh, they now do to the internet is that the networks are too homogeneous, but from the very beginning, the internet has been, has connected any type of internet. It, it even has uh, supported new protocols, new systems, new technologies. And it, he also mentioned the separation of the routing and the TCP from the IP and uh, the layer system that they established in this design. So, Vint, go ahead. The next question. Uh, another thing which is very important, the IP layer, uh, if, you, if you read the protocol spec, does not know how it's being carried. It doesn't know whether it's going over a satellite link or radio connection, an optical fiber or something else, nor does it know how it's, uh, what it's carrying. So the IP packets don't know what's in the payload. These are two important ignorances uh, because they have enabled the internet to um, expand in several dimensions. First of all, when you add a new transport capability, the internet protocol layer didn't care because it didn't know about that. So when optical fiber became available uh, to the internet uh, as early as 1982 or 83, uh, we just swept it right in underneath the IP layer with no problem. Uh, second, uh, as somebody wanted to bring up a new application, the IP layer doesn't need to know about that because all it knows is it's carrying a bag of bits in the payload to some destination. 
the interpretation of the bits is at the edges of the net where the host computers are. So the consequence of that is that if you added a new application which required inter new interpretation of the bits in the internet protocol layer of packets, uh, that job was not down in the network, it was at the edges of the net. Uh, the assumption that the machines on the net were time-shared uh, also uh, facilitated the introduction of cloud computing, for example, uh, because cloud computers are, are for all practical purposes, um, time-shared computing on steroids, I guess. Uh, and so that was not a, a significant conceptual change, except for scale. I mean, the, the, uh, the data centers of the Google uh, Cloud and the other clouds uh, are really vast in their uh, scope. And yet the protocol architecture of the network is very comfortable with, uh, with all of that. Uh, we also uh, uh, allowed for a lot of uh, innovation, uh, both in, in horizontal and in vertical terms in the protocol architecture of the internet. So when Tim Berners-Lee invented the World Wide Web and introduced the hypertext transport protocol, it just layered in right on top of TCP and we were all happy with that. Nothing else had to change. The same argument could be made in the, uh, in the horizontal sense when we added UDP, for example, or real-time communication protocols or other, other kinds of uh, mechanisms. Uh, they just occupy another place in this protocol architecture, uh, and it doesn't disturb anybody because it's just another, another kind of protocol that you could run vertically and horizontally. So I would say that I'm sure there are other things to, uh, to include, but those are some of the primary reasons why the internet architecture has been so flexible and so adaptable over time. I guess from the institutional point of view, let me also say that uh, the participants in the internet's evolution have been very egalitarian about um, and uh, inviting of new ideas. And so uh, when anybody came along with a new idea to add to the architecture, it was, uh, it was allowed uh, that they could do that. Um, and if it succeeded, everybody was happy. And if it didn't succeed, well, it, it was just an experiment that didn't work. Uh, so this flexibility to uh, formally allow new protocols to be invented and inter introduced into the architecture also contributed. Uh, to, I, I would say, the enormous success that the internet has had over its, uh, well, now almost 40-year lifetime. It's it is most interesting to listen to this part where he expands on an expression that I love. This is a double ignorance. The IP protocol is ignorant in respect to what is below and what is above. So what does he mean with this? This means that the internet layer, the protocol layer, is unchanged as new transmission technologies arise. When he created this, this began at times when Ethernet did not exist and LTE or 5G even did not exist. And he speaks ignorance upwards. These are the new applications. The new applications, the only thing that existed at the time was exchanging files. But the wealth we have today is enormous. And he makes an additional reflection, which I think is most interesting to highlight. There is an institutional aspect as he describes it. And this has to do with this opening of approving things. This is a modularity of the IP stack. And this allows you to investigate and test things out and if it doesn't work well this is an experiment that didn't work and we test something else so this step in the evolution the level of tests and the freedom to make mistakes is something that somehow or other over all these years has led to the internet that we have today oscar yes together with carlos we have had the opportunity of interviewing some of the pioneers of the internet for this study. And we are well aware that many of the decisions that were introduced in this internet design were aware, were done consciously, there was a specific purpose to them. And when one is not aware of that part of the history, when we use the internet today and we think, well, it was designed that way and that is a status in which it appeared in some kind of magic back in the 70s, but that was not the case at all. This was the result of many decisions. Some have had to be adjusted and some even have been mistaken decisions. And precisely we asked Vint if he had regretted any decisions that he had made along the way and if it was necessary to rebuild or reorient the direction. And this is what he answered us. 
Uh, well, it, I mean, we've had this conversation many times. There are mistakes. Uh, there are mistakes, uh, and, and I regret them. Uh, one mistake, of course, is that we didn't adopt the IP version 6 128-bit address space earlier uh, in the architecture. Now, think about it. We introduced it in 1996. You know, the Internet had been running for 13 years at that point. And it was at that point in 1992 we all realized that the 4.3 billion addresses of IPv4 were not going to be enough. Um, and I wished at that time that uh, we had been able to just get everybody to introduce IPv6 right away. And I sort of thought people would recognize that, that uh, it, how useful it would be to do that then before the network got any bigger. But it was right in the middle of the dot boom period after the World Wide Web showed up and after Netscape Communications did its initial uh, public offering and the stock went through the roof and everybody was throwing money at anything that looked like internet. So uh, the consequences of, of that were that nobody paid any attention to IPv6 because they said we haven't run out of IPv4 and we're busy trying to build new applications and starting our companies and so on. Uh, and so unfortunately that persists uh, to this very day. Now I think we're seeing some serious motion towards v6, especially in the mobile environment, which is increasingly a dominant means by which internet access is accomplished. Uh, so, uh, so that's one thing I wish that we could have done differently. Of course, in 1973 or four, when Bob and I made the original IPv4 design, um, it wasn't even that. I mean, IP hadn't even been split off, but the, but the basic address uh, space uh, we had done a little back of the envelope calculation and the v4 address space was enough for 4.3 billion terminations which is more than there were people in the world so we kind of thought that ought to be enough for an experiment which it was uh, it's just that the experiment got loose and it got into the public and now we need v6 Bien, eh, solo como referencia, eh, eh, cuando diseñaron... Only as a reference, when uh, they designed IPv4, the, uh, there were 4 billion people in the world. So, maybe 2 to the 32nd, uh, it's the number that they had thought. But how recurrent events are... Uh, Common says that they uh, regret this decision because they could have done it larger from the very beginning and we wouldn't have had this challenge that we have today. I think that, as he puts it, it was uh, quite, uh, they did have a margin at the time. There were only 2,000 computers in the world in the 70s, not even connected in uh, mainframes uh, and uh, big uh, halls for a central processor and very few were connected uh, with each other L fewer than uh, uh, some dozens so four billion uh, terminations of ip addresses sounded hyper but even so uh, the internet showed that they were l that the, its growth would be stunt uh, uh, and what they tell us, what he tells us now, is that we have to think of IPv6 only as the next frontier. So, um, go ahead, Vint. Another thing which um, some people complain about is that the network isn't as secure as we would like it to be, and that's still true today. Uh, when this was started, uh, I knew very well that it was intended for a command and control uh, framework for the military, the U.S. military. And I worked very closely with the National Security Agency on the design of a secure version of the system using what was then classified crypto cryptographic equipment. So uh, some of the work was classified and we weren't able to share it with the rest of the community that was uh, evolving uh, the internet. Uh, when the uh, public key crypto came along, it was 1976. I, we didn't really see RSA implementations until something like 79 or so. And I was running the program at ARPA at that time, and I just wanted to get the thing running. And I was afraid that if we had tried to force in all of the end-to-end -end crypto capability, that it would impede our ability to demonstrate the basic capability of the system. So I postponed that in the belief, uh, correct belief, that you could retrofit uh, a lot of that into the architecture without too much damage, as you have seen with TLS and with IPsec and with some of the now the more recent quick uh, protocols. Uh, all of those things, HTTPS, have uh, become part of the normal operation. And so uh, I was right about that. 
Uh, what is still missing, of course, is better discipline for all of us in the use of cryptographic methods to protect yes. things, to factor authentication, and so on. So I, uh, in some ways, I wish we could have pushed that a little harder. Um, it, there was, um, let's see, so that's the address space. Uh, oh, I know. Here's one other really big mistake that I made. Um, when we split the TCP and the IT protocols, I thought I had done something very clever by creating what's called a pseudo header for TCP, which bound uh, the TCP layer to the IP layer for any particular connection that was established. What that meant is that if you change your IP address, then you broke uh, the TCP connection. And I thought that we had dealt with the mobility problem using the packet radio network, because I knew you could move around in the packet radio net and not lose your TCP connection. The problem is that that um, binding was done at a lower layer than the IP layer. It was being done at the packet radio network layer. And I just didn't think about the problem of moving to a different packet radio network, for example, with a different IP address. And if I had thought more carefully about that, uh, we would have had identifier spaces up at the TCP layer that would allow you to maintain a TCP connection even if the IP connection broke or, or the IP address has changed. Turns out, uh, of course, that wasn't the case. And when the quick protocols came along at Google and now have been standardized at IETF, there's a cryptographic variable that's shared by both ends. And so if you lose the connection and you reestablish it with a different IP address on one side, not both, but on one side, you can reestablish the connection very quickly. Uh, and you can trust the new IP address as being the same party as the old IP address because of the shared cryptographic variable. So, uh, so that's one thing I, I stupidly uh, did not take into account and should have. I have to admit, at the time, I thought I was being smart because I was I kept the TCP header from getting bigger. And I was already worried that by splitting the protocols, we'd added another header to, uh, to the uh, uh, amount of overhead associated with the TCP IP packet. So now we go on with the regrets. And uh, well, maybe uh, we are more familiar with this. This has to do with the uh, security and the use uh, of end-to-end -end cryptography. That is something that has been on the news uh, for many years, like Snowden's revelations. And we assume that it was always possible. But what Vint is saying, and this is um, uh, interesting historically, is that when they were implementing uh, the TCP IP network under ARPA umbrella, the, the RCA algorithm was not there. And and until today, we we use it, and it was it was defined in 1976. But it, there weren't any usable implementations until 1979. So sometimes we assume that we always had the technological tools, while actually we didn't have them, uh, and that sort of conditioned the design decisions at the time. So it's interesting to listen what he says because he knew that that was important. He knew that they had to do it, but it was impossible because the technology was not there. The other thing that he regrets is that interesting, and it reminds me of my times as a lecturer at the university, is with the pseudo header of the DCP. If you think how you have to implement the pilot, you have to receive the packets, and you have the processes that you're listening in the sockets to deliver the uh, TCP packets. And that binding depends on both uh, on the IP and the TCP packets. And he thought that he was being very smart by emitting uh, an identification of the TCP and using the IP addresses for that. So he said that anyway, as the problem of mobility is solved, because we have a radio network, one radio network, that's a key thing in history. I don't have to worry about mobility. And something that we suffer today, when I change my network, then the uh, um, uh, my connection clashes. So a uh, problem that we experience today is uh, has long roots. And an, another thing that will be a great finding is the modularity of all uh, the protocol stacks that allows us to somehow solve these things. How do we solve the 
end-to-end -end cryptography with the CCLTLDES. It's that uh, were developed almost 20 years later. And he mentions a protocol that is less known, but I assure you that you are going you're going to listen about it. it's quick. Quick is the evolution of TCP and solves the product problems of those clashes because it includes an identifier in the connection. So now let's go on with another question that somehow um, builds on this. Um, so what were the design solutions? So what should we do in the future? So we asked event. TCP IP was introduced uh, uh, some uh, years after the internet uh, became a reality. So it's not in the foundation of uh, the internet, but it happened when it was already operating. So the question is, given that this very significant change uh, allowed uh, the growth and the scalability of the internet today, what are the changes do you consider that have enabled this growth and scalability? Uh, I would say that the most, uh, the two most significant things that were developed uh, that have enabled growth. The first one was the domain name system, which uh, you begin to see showing up around 1983, 1984. Then, uh, so that one enabled enormous expansion of the address space and the ability to find IP addresses bound to domain names. The second thing, which was equally important, uh, was the evolution of the uh, interior gateway protocols or the gateway gateway protocols that Bolt, Baranek, and Newman developed in the earliest days of, uh, of internet. Um, then came uh, the exterior gateway protocol, which Bob Kahn and I uh, wanted and pushed for so that other than Bolt, Baranek, and Newman could build gateways. So we wanted this to be a collaborative thing, a competitive thing. And then when the NSFnet came along and added uh, a, a total of something like 12 or 13 more networks, the backbone plus the inter intermediate layer networks, suddenly they needed uh, a much more um, reliable uh, protocol for uh, announcing connectivity in the network. And that was the border gateway protocol, which went through four iterations. And I remember having a lot of arguments with uh, Jakob Rector, who was one of the key developers of BGP. He wanted to put it on top of TCP. And I thought, well, that's sort of weird because, you know, BGP is way down at the IP layer. Well, you know, why are you running it on top of TCP? He wanted reliability that the TCP afforded. And it turns out also as the uh, size of the announcements got bigger, you eventually couldn't do it in a single packet, which is what you get with IP. Uh, and so his TCP ID actually turned out to be very useful. In any event, the introduction of BGP, which is now BGP4, absolutely contributed to the scale of, uh, of the network and its ability to uh, route routing information around uh, in the system, uh, allowed it, allowing it to operate at scale. So I would say those are two very, very important uh, elements. Well, los, los otros dos aspectos que nos menciona tienen que ver también con ya si se quiere, no con el stack de protocolos en sí mismo, sino con dos funciones de soporte, pero que son dos funciones clave. Una es el sistema de nombre de dominio, el DNS, que él, eh, lo destaca como un elemento que permitió ampliar... Highlights es un elemento que permitió ampliar el espacio de space. Y si about this, esto, cuando introducimos el problema de los nombres y la dirección de la estamos expandiendo the capacity we have to name things. This linked with other things of protocols precisely expands the amount of things that we can address in the internet. DNS in itself has a very interesting history. It's a protocol that scales up very well. It has been on since the beginning of the 80s and so far to date. And we could really speak a lot about this. And another element that he highlights is routing, the routing component, and he mentions the predecessor of BGP, the exterior gateway protocol that we, those who configured in Cisco were aware that we have the fossils of BGP at that time. And he tells us about these issues that were so interesting, which is a conversation he had with a BGP designer where he said, why should you transport BGP on TCP if you don't really need it? And the person argued about this and went, admitted that that person was right because 
hand in hand with scalability at the internet, there came a time where the amount of announcements that have to make no longer fit in one single packet. So that is where TCP comes up. So those are the decisions that I can even read it as something that was the result of exchange of ideas with other pieces that led to a good design decision. And we have been scaling internet based on that. So let's go on to the next. Yes, it is quite ironical, Carlos, how these two elements, which are the pillars in the scalability of the internet, are those who are mostly blamed by the media because of what we do, those of us of us who are behind those elements. The most recently were the social media blamed PGP. Those who are in charge of configuring PGP. So let us now speak about the decentralization and maybe speaking today about decentralized entities or decentralized projects is quite common because we have blockchain and many projects associated to blockchain that speak about the decentralizing of subjects and topics. Now, the internet was born with that concept, and it was not just chance, but this was designed so as not to have a gatekeeper, not an authority to authorize entrance, nor central authority, authority to determine who would be connected and who not. And Vint can tell us that there are central authorities for domain names and for IP issues, but this is more from the administrative point of view, but not for accessing the internet. Today, anyone who can physically connect can do so. They can connect to the internet without having anyone's authorization. So the question here is, why do you think think, Vint, that this feature was important for the development of the internet, to what extent the technical decisions made regarding the design of the internet that took away that gatekeeper collaborated in this sense. Let's see what he tells us. Vint. It was absolutely conscious, uh, no, no question whatsoever. The, the reason that it was important not to have some central authority, with one exception, the, the um, management of the IP address space and the unique assignment, similarly management of the domain names, which also require unique assignment, that had to be done in some central way. One could make some arguments about blockchain, and a lot of people do, that you could achieve similar uh, kinds of uh, uniqueness by being able to refer back to a common uh, database of assignments, so you avoid assigning something twice uh, to two different parties. Uh, but uh, I'm not necessarily a huge fan of blockchain. Um, and the result is that we ended up with the Internet Corporation for assigned names and numbers to manage the domain name space and the IP address allocations and the re regional internet registries, which you know well, uh, and uh, and the uh, uh, red, the locknicks and uh, of the world, um, plus registries and registrars for the domain names. Um, but it was very deliberate that we uh, chose a uh, non-hierarchical um, management structure because I believed at the time that we were doing the original design that the uh, United States Defense Department could not be the responsible party for the networking of other allies, that every ally would have its own networks and they would be responsible for their operation and implementation. And so we had to work in a collaborative and cooperative way. And that was looking at it just from the standpoint of uh, command and control uh, uses by the Defense Department. Now, when you translate that into uh, the private sector, you realize that having a central authority would inhibit innovation uh, in, in many dimensions, technical innovation, business innovation, what business models are driving a particular network. Well, we contemplated that there might be many different business models and we didn't want to dictate any of them. Could be a nonprofit, could be for-profit, could be government operated, could be a collaborative, could be a cooperative. Uh, and we didn't care. All we cared about is that any entity that was part of the internet system followed the specific protocols and achieved interoperability. And so this distributed non-hierarchical structure was very important for Internet success. It still is, 
Uh, and uh, the, the fact that we need some discipline in IP address assignment and domain name uh, assignment is, is the only part of the system, in my view, uh, that has to be centralized. Even the protocol standards uh, are being done by multiple parties. The IETF, of course, is very central to that. But then so is the World Wide Web Consortium for web-based protocol uh, standardization. And there are others at IEEE, for example, 802 for the wireless uh, and, and local area network systems. Say nothing of 4G, 5G, and 6G, which show up at 3GPT. Uh, so there are many different parties that can contribute to the technology of the internet. And I'm, actually, I think one of the most satisfying aspects of the internet's design is that it allows this kind of collaborative work across so many different institutions and organizations. De manera absolutamente consciente tomar. So you were absolutely aware that you didn't want a central authority allowing people in or what were the apps that could be run or what business models were acceptable. And not only to have this uh, central uh, command uh, and control point, but also to favor innovation. And apparently, they succeeded. Today, we have 50 years of uh, protocol development systems and standards in different organizations, IETF, uh, IEEE, triple e that participate in this process in a decentralized manner in collaboration and today we have something that the new generations give for granted such as the ubiquitous internet uh, all over the world and magically they manage to connect wherever they are now speaking of magic let's uh, make uh, let's uh, take advantage of uh, the magic that uh, we we can pause this video this interview to uh, um, uh, change uh, a bit gears, uh, and um, Andrea is going to explain the dynamics. Thank you, Oscar. Well, we wanted to organize this in an interactive manner, so we want you all to participate. So please take your devices, because we are going to invite you to enter I have live, so we're going to sh um, AHA slides. We're going to show you the QR code, so you can access, and we are, you're going to be able to access through a link that we're going to put on the chat. The link is ahaslides.com slash vintsurf. ahaslides.com slash Serve. And there we're going to request you to mention three factors that you consider more important for the development of the Internet. That is, you're going to see when you uh, enter that you have three boxes. Please um, check them with one word and fill them in with uh, the word that you consider to be most important for the development of the Internet. So now we'll, we'll go on with the interview and then Carlos and Oscar will show us a cloud with the words that uh, uh, our community consider to be important for the development of the Internet. So Carlos, please go on with your interview. Thank you, Andrea. Well, so now let's go with the next question. We already talked a lot with Vint about uh, TCP, IP, and other factors that uh, made the Internet what it is. And we asked them, what other evolutionary changes should the Internet go through over the next uh, years to support continued scalability? Absolutely. Uh, first of all, uh, IPv6 is important, and I know Lucknick and others have been repeatedly beating the drum along with me and others. Um, and I hope that we will get to the point where people recognize that and just get it implemented. Uh, being able to run IPv6 only is the key uh, test uh, so that we don't rely anymore on IPv4. Uh, the second thing, which is um, very apparent, of course, is that uh, the number of devices that will be on the Internet will increase well beyond the population of the planet. We're already well past that. There are billions of devices, more than there are people. Uh, so we need to have plenty of address space for that. There is uh, an anticipated um, extension of the Internet called the Interplanetary Internet. And we, uh, the team which has been looking at that at NASA and JAXA and ESA and, uh, and uh, the, the Korean Space Agency, uh, among others, uh, have settled on a new protocol suite called the Bundle Protocol Suite, which is 
uh, similar in spirit to the IP address space or IP structure, except I shouldn't say IP address, but it's, it's similar to the IP protocol. Um, bundle and packet being uh, similar terms to evoke the same notions. <clears throat> However, in the case of the uh, bundle protocols, they're designed for interplanetary communication. The uh, variations in delay are dramatic. I mean, we're talking minutes to hours to days, uh, depending on how far away the two parties are. Uh, and the second thing is that it's a disrupted environment because you know, the planets are rotating and we don't know how to stop that. So eventually, if you can't communicate, you have to wait until the planet rotates around to get to the point where something on the surface can communicate back to you. So this variably delayed and, and uh, disrupted environment has demanded something more resilient than the TCP IP protocols can deliver. Uh, the uh, side effect of all this is that uh, the routing system and the naming system has had to change. So imagine that you're on Mars and you're trying to use DNS as, mm -hmm. uh, as a way of finding the correct IP address in order to send a packet to some place on Earth. Well, uh, first of all, the round trip times could be as much as 40 minutes and longer, of course, if you have to do retransmissions. So imagine that you've just asked for the translation of the domain name into an IP address. You're on Mars, you're trying to send something to Earth. 40 minutes later, you get an IP address. And it turns out that that IP address is no longer valid because the party that delivered it has just moved to a different network because it was mobile. So, you know, DNS doesn't work. So we split it into two parts. First, find the planet that you're going to, and then after you get the bundle to the planet, let that do a local lookup in order to figure out where it's actually supposed to go. So we've had to um, change the way in which we do uh, the protocols for communication. We can still use internet, but we would use it on planet, or we would use it in some you know local context, like an, on an asteroid or a spacecraft that's on its way from Earth to someplace else. So um, we, so I would anticipate that for interplanetary purposes, uh, we would not literally have um, a TCP IP backbone, but rather we would have a bundle protocol backbone, which takes advantage of TCP IP when it's on a particular planet or a particular moon or an asteroid or whatever, or, or a spacecraft. So that's a, a, a predictable extension or expansion of the internet concept, but in a different protocol space. Bueno, uh, adelante, adelante. <laughs> yes, go ahead. This uh, answer for me is fascinating. It has an aspect that maybe we're all more familiar with. Uh, you've heard us repeat once and again that we believe that IPv6 is um, an element that is absolutely necessary for the growth of the Internet, without which we cannot preserve the good characteristics that the Internet has today. The good news is that in our region, particularly in Uruguay, the use of IPv6 has grown. As a matter of fact, those of you using uh, Wi-Fi here are using IPv6, and I'm aware that in Pergamino, too, you have IPv6. So now it's more uh, common practice, but we should not neglect this. Uh, and uh, as Vint says, we need uh, to preach uh, among people that it's necessary and we have to do it. The second part of the question is absolutely interesting because he explored uh, the, an evolution of the Internet where he introduces a variable that didn't exist in the past. What is it if the delay of uh, propagation between the two stations is too long? Uh, hours or days, the interplanetary internet. And he gives a number of very interesting examples as to how the traditional elements, DNS and even TCP, cannot be used in such an environment because, in a way, the uh, questions and answers are never, uh, the, the loop is not uh, closed in uh, a reasonable time. So based on what we know of TCP IP, is it possible to build other protocols that don't look like TCP IP but somehow get supported on a number of, pro of uh, concepts and use them when he use he speaks of the bundle uh, protocol that was established uh, some years ago for cases like this. Although this sounds uh, too uh, far fetched uh, because it's it's so far from our experience in Uruguay, well, it could be applied to closer 
uh, scenarios because if you think of the problem of interconnecting two stations in a high latency environment it it's very similar to connecting two stations when you have intermittent connectivity so this is an idea that has applications that go beyond the interplanetary uh, scenario. It may be closer to us, and it's common in technologies. You may design it for one thing, but then you find out that it serves other purposes. Oscar? Thank you, Carlos. We have traveled to the past of the internet, and we're going to ask him what are the challenges he sees for the internet in general terms for the coming 50 years. Let's see what he tells us. Well, if, first of all, uh, getting everybody up online, of course, is a big opportunity because half the world is still to be connected. And so that's a big, you know, so we're talking 3.7 or 3.8 billion people. Uh, so that's a big business opportunity for uh, for those who uh, are interested in the basic infrastructure. Uh, and it's very evident that there is, seems to be no end to the number of applications people can invent, especially in the uh, mobile environment with literally millions of, of apps. Uh, to say nothing of the flexibility of the protocol architecture, which we talked about earlier, which means that over the decades to come, people are free to invent new protocols that will support new kinds of applications. So I am uh, persuaded that the best days of internet are yet to come, not only from the standpoint of the things that we can do, the speeds at which we can operate. I mean, think about the data rates that we can achieve now on optical fiber networks is 400 gigabits a second per channel. And that may become a, literally a terabit per second at some point. Uh, have you seen the rapid growth of undersea cable? Con you know, bringing connectivity to say nothing of the low earth orbiting satellite efforts that are underway uh, with Starlink, for example, and OneWeb and uh, Cooper, uh, which translates into uh, inability to escape access to the internet because every square inch of the surface of the planet, including the oceans, will be reachable from the low earth orbiting satellites. So over the course of this decade and the next one, we'll see both an intensifying of the, uh, or intensification of access to the internet, availability of the internet, and also, of course, the growth of the interplanetary backbone. Uh, at this point, the real driver is going to be cost. And how do we drive cost out to make the internet affordable? Because even if it's present, if it's not affordable, people won't be able to use it. And that uh, goes not only to the cost of access, but also to the cost of the equipment that's needed in order to make use of, uh, of the internet as we know it now. Por supuesto, eh, conectividad para... Of course, connectivity for all, internet for all, ubiquitous internet is the main challenge we have. This is now a minor issue, and it is precisely here where our community has the main opportunity. Our access, internet access providers are relevant players to respond to this challenge. And precisely now that we're speaking, of our community, we now go over to the last question and want to, want to know what would be the message that you could give to those of us who participate in LACNIC 36 and in general to all those who participate in our community, LACNIC and LACNOG community, LACNIC uh, the peering forum. And we'd always like to thank Vin for his excellent availability and disposition. I don't know. Last week, Vint was telling us with all the details about all these wonderful decisions that they made. So I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Vint in advance. I would like to ask him what message you'd like to give to the community. Well, the first one is thank you, uh, because uh, those of you who are watching this are part of the community that has made the internet work has it worked so hard to expand access to it and make it reliable and more safe and secure. So uh, I want to thank you for that on behalf of all of the beneficiaries, including me, uh, of that work. Second, um, there is uh, equal, should be equal appreciation for the continued uh, evolution of the uh, Internet's architecture and protocols, and that much of that comes from the academic community and uh, also, frankly, from the private sector, which is innovating to offer new products and services. The third thing I would say is that uh, we've been forced by the pandemic 
to uh, accelerate our use of the internet for remote medicine and remote education and, and remote work. And we're, we've been pushed uh, to evolve that capability over the course of a two year period, which should have taken more like 10 or 15 years. It's not by any means perfect, but we've learned a lot, I think, in that uh, intense two year period. We've also learned in the course of the pandemic that uh, there are real cracks in uh, the uniformity of access to the internet. There are real uh, breaches. The digital divide is real. Uh, it's economic. Uh, sometimes it's just physical because the, the local facilities in a rural area just may not have suitable access to the internet. So uh, we see lots of different digital divides that are, uh, are present. And we now need to work collectively to bridge them so that everyone has useful access to the Internet. And I know that the people who are part of the LACNIC community are very committed to that. And I just want to encourage uh, that commitment and, uh, and encourage your continued effort to make the Internet truly available to everyone. Bien. Eh all right with a, a bit uh, of pity i think we got to the end of the interview it was a beautiful experience for me to uh, to uh, do that activity and i'd like to summarize so hand in hand with vint we went from the very beginning of the internet until today and beyond going through things that were done well, the things that he regrets. As a matter of fact, he uses the word regret and error uh, quite freely. And from from the beginning, where the idea of, of uh, the independence of uh, the ignorance uh, upstream and downstream, I think that it's the most uh, essential idea. So basically, all of us uh, could change things uh, as years went by. So these early decisions that we can summarize in the terms of flexibility and modularity, flexibility to add a new design elements and uh, a modularity to take it as a puzzle where the apps pass uh, become pieces in the puzzle, and we use them when we need them, and we discard them when we no longer new, need them. And the new transports, that's very important because the evolution in terms of radio technologies never stops. And fortunately, we don't have to change the entire internet every time that we have a new generation of uh, mobile phones. Now we use hear a lot of 5G, but uh, they're, they're already working at 6G. And the same of Wi-Fi, the idea of Wi-Fi didn't even exist when all this was created. So there are some regrets concerning security, maybe not having included end-to-end -end cryptography in the early times of the internet, Some somehow that uh, solved with m modularity. But it is still something that uh, makes us work uh, hard today. There's a technical aspect that can be highlighted it is the use of IPv6 and its uh, intelligence in the borders, in the edges. The difficult processing is done in the devices, in the mobiles and the computers, not in the routers. The routers work at scale and their operation is very simple. That split makes it possible for you to innovate freely because you only have to work on the, the ends. So when a new app appears, you download the app in your phone, but you don't have to do the change the Wi-Fi at home or do re-engineering because it, it, if not, it won't work. And there are other things that have to do with organizational things and human behaviors that uh, made it possible to make the most of these advantages. These ideas would not, we wouldn't have been able to leverage um, without uh, collaboration among people. The IETF, for instance, other standardization agencies such as I triple E that uh, all support the idea of a shared work a collaboration at work. There is no doubt that we have uh, challenges ahead. One of the most uh, significant that Vint mentions is connecting the unconnected. He speaks of the digital divide, how that a real gap and uh, how the pandemic made it uh, more apparent because although 
most of us could continue with our lives, I wouldn't say normal, but more or less normal. But there were people who couldn't do the same. We have a very enriching future, in, but uh, it won't be free from challenges. So thank you, Oscar. You, you say the clothes sing words yes so let's uh, review our cloud you know that uh, about 150 people contributed to the dynamic of this exercise and they speak of scalability security the perception that we have of security of course and everything that was done to provide uh, uh, security and trust uh, to transactions um dg uh, BGP, flexibility, DNS, uh, flexible, different terms for the same concept. And in general, some of the elements that were mentioned here. I want to thank not just the participants, uh, the, but all those of you who are connected through different means, both online, through our Zoom, and YouTube, the hub of Pergamino. Thank you for this effort, this experiment. Hopefully, we'll be able to replicate this exercise. So that would be all. Thank you.